Hello, welcome or welcome back to Sapling Tarot. Today I'm going to be doing a bit of a mega tag. I've had the Catomancy Tarot Origins tag on my list to do and that merged so beautifully with Astral Lady Tarot's new creation of why spirituality. <laughs> Um, her unasked for VR about spirituality and spiritual path and how you got here and where you're going and what we're doing and all, all of that kind of stuff. So I have smashed these two um, lists of questions together and while I'm answering these questions I'm going to be showing you the images from my oldest deck and my newest deck, just to give you something to look at while I blather on about my history with tarot and spirituality and get a little bit personal. So, the first question in both tags asks about your religious upbringing. Now, I grew up in a slightly fractured family, so there are, there are aspects to this question. On the one hand, I grew up in England, and I went through traditional schooling, which for most primary schools um, in England certainly is Church of England, Protestant, Christian schooling. Um, I was quite into it as a child. I liked the stories and that will come up as being quite a theme in, um, in a lot of these questions is I just found it really interesting. I then went on to an Anglican Methodist middle school and sort of lost the thread a little bit in terms of Christianity and, and just kind of that more, more broadly. Then I moved to Ireland and went to a Augustinian Catholic school and then I came back to England and the rest of my education was in non-religious schools. In terms of home life, um, one half of my family really wasn't religious at all. If anything, um, the main influences in my life were pretty brutally atheist. Um, an interest in faith and religion, but generally a, a disdain for organised religion. Um, as we knew it. Um, and then the other part of my family, it was more a case of going to church on a Sunday because that's what you do. I never really had a sense that it was because of some deep spiritual drive or deeply held faith. It was just sort of the social expectation in the community that we lived in. Um, I did go to Bible camp during my summer holidays because of this um, community-based religious practice um, and that was Protestant Christian based and I learned the stories and I, you know, I was there. <laughs> didn't necessarily believe in it but I, I was there and I absorbed it and I didn't really have too much issue with it. But then I suppose the, the main religion in my life at any point was when I went to an Irish Catholic Augustinian school uh, with proper priests and monks maybe and uh, going to mass, well it's not mass is it, it's um, going to like proper church services um, and doing confession and communion and that kind of stuff and that was where it got a little bit tricky because by that point I, so that was, I don't know, age 11 or 12, um, by that point I knew I didn't believe um, in the Christian God but I had the utmost respect for people who did and I thought that the respectful thing to do would be to not participate because it's a Catholic thing so we're talking transubstantiation, we're talking actually believing that you are ingesting the body and blood of Christ um, and so to me it felt really disrespectful to participate in that as a non-believer um, and that was where it got a bit difficult because apparently I was wrong and what was more respectful was just to kind of put up and shut up and go along with it even if you didn't believe 
um, which still to this day kind of baffles me. Um, but yeah, that was where the, the religious friction reached kind of a high point in my life, I suppose. And beyond that, I haven't really, I haven't really had much in the way of religious or spiritual guidance. Anything that I come to, I've come to mostly by myself. Um, always been interested in studying religion and philosophy at school. Done a fair amount of research in my own time. It's always been a particular topic of interest um, for me. But in terms of my upbringing, kind of minimal spiritual basis for anything. Question two, your first exposure to tarot and your first deck. So I think it would be really hard to work out exactly the first time I was ever exposed to tarot more broadly, you know, through media or whatever. Um, but the instance that really springs to mind is I received a tarot reading from a really dear friend and neighbour um, when I was probably about 12 or 13 um, and I really respected her, she was, I think I still really respect her, um, she's incredibly intelligent, incredibly wise, very insightful, uh, knew loads about all sorts of things that I was really fascinated in, um, she was just really cool. And so she did a reading and she did a reading with this deck, um, which ironically is a deck that I said to myself I wouldn't really show on camera. I don't read with it publicly. Um, I It matters an awful lot to me that I understand that its roots are in a slightly culty place. So I don't. <laughs> My intention was to not really talk about it, but I can't not talk about it if I'm talking about the history of how I got into tarot because this is where it all started. So this is the Osho Zen tarot. Um, it's based on the teachings of Osho, who was a slightly, more than slightly problematic uh, character, um, but it came out I think after his death and it's based sort of more broadly on like the better parts of his teachings um, or the more manageable, <laughs> approachable parts. There are some cards in here that I, um, I understand what they're driving at, but the imagery or the labelling is not something that I would particularly support or condone. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a funny, it's a bit of a funny deck, but it's one that I won't get rid of because it was my first deck, it was the first deck that anyone ever read for me with, and then it was the first deck that I went on to receive pretty soon thereafter. My first reading um, was a Celtic Cross spread, and then she went on to do a Past Lives spread and um, it was really fascinating and I was kind of hooked there and then. Um, I received the deck as a present I think from my mum pretty soon soon after because I think she saw how how connected I was to it um, and it was my only deck for the first 15 years of my practice maybe um, and it just kind of never really occurred to me to look outside of this deck to follow the more traditional oh there we go there's there's a really dodgy one um to to look outside this deck or to learn traditional systems and stuff until much much later and relatively recently um so yeah my first exposure to tarot and my first deck right here the third question is when did you stop being a tarot sceptic? When was your tarot conversion? And I don't have a particularly clear answer for this. I think I am as much a tarot believer now as I was the first reading I ever had, and I'm as much of a sceptic now as I was at the very beginning. Um, I my spiritual practice in general is this kind of 50-50 split between faith and scepticism um, and that's part of what makes my practice sustainable for me is because it's based on questioning, it's based on um, not taking anything at face value 
and always looking a little bit deeper and sussing out how I feel about things and yeah so it's it's an interesting thing I would say that I am still a tarot skeptic in a way <laughs> half the time I don't when I start like when I go to a market or something and I'm on the train there in the morning there's so much of me that is uh, expecting that I've just forgotten it all and it's never going to work and um, it's all just made up and suddenly I'm going to forget everything and it's all going to fall out of my head um, and that that's never really gone away um, so yeah, sorry to not have a really, um, you know, on this date and this time and suddenly I was a believer and I've never looked back and um, yeah, sorry that's a bit more of a wishy-washy answer. So question four, when did you start reading for others or clients and why? So I've read for friends since I was a teenager, so 13, 14. 15 um, and tarot did the spooky thing that tarot does and it was eerily accurate and it predicted things and um, it was great I loved it um, came back to it over the years didn't really read for many people um, would just do it occasionally with really close friends or kind of in that sort of sleepover esque um, environment and that was sort of it for a long time and then it was only last year that I decided to give it a go and see if I could share what tarot has done for me with other people um, and I decided to get to grips with at least one classic system so I'm more of a, an RWS girly and I would I would like to delve into I mean I've been trying to dive into Marseille and I'm a little bit tentative about Thoth or Thoth or whatever but I have no doubt that eventually I'll um I'll crack and I'll I'll find myself a deck and I'll I'll try and learn that too. Um so I've been reading for paying clients for about a year and a half now and it's really exciting and I love it and every time I do it it fills me with so much joy and contentment and satisfaction and yeah I mean I'm I'm disabled so it's quite difficult <laughs> to um to find work that I can do that is sustainable or um you know that I have the energy for and um yeah, so that's, again, it's a bit of a wishy-washy reason that I started reading for friends because it was fun and it was cool and it was a bit spooky. Um, I think that's probably how many people start and then I started reading for clients because I was kind of scratching around trying to think of what I could provide in terms of services to my community and it's a bit of a weird one but it's what I love and um, yeah it's uh, it's where I'm at now so my tarot superpower from my background is probably not so much to do with like my upbringing background or uh, the people who raised me and more to do with my unfortunate uh, amount of experience in the mental health and mental unwellness space. Um, the the time and the energy that I've had to dedicate to therapy and learning about psychology and um, how people operate, um, but also autistic pattern recognition. And there's something really particular about being raised as a girl with an autistic brain and an undiagnosed autistic brain for a long time is that a lot of the stereotypes about autism kind of go out the window because 
you don't really have an option. You can't not know <laughs> about social situations and about people. You have to you have to know, you have to be able to understand, you have to be able to predict people. So it's not socially acceptable if you are raised as a girl to not at least be able to kind of muddle along socially. And so like many people who were raised as girls and young women, um, people became one of my, oh, grammar, people became one of my special interests. And I was fascinated and learning about what makes people tick and how to predict people and how to understand people and how to read people became an ultimate lifetime fascination um, and priority um, whether that's through <laughs> watching Made in Chelsea <laughs> or through the tarot and learning about these archetypes and how they show up time and time again in every human's life and about how you can relate every single one of these cards to stuff that happens to every single one of us. In terms of the tarot superpower, I think that all that experience and learning and also kind of the weird sort of <laughs> double-edged privilege of being able to take the time out, um, if that's what you want to call it, to learn all of this stuff. Um, you know, while I wasn't able to participate in normal human life, I've been able to learn shit. And yeah, just kind of, it all, it all comes back to all of the archetypes and all of the stories that are within the tarot. So I'm going to call that my superpower. Okay, when did you get into tarot tube? I actually looked this up. I found a way to um, find out when I first started following various tarot tubers um, or when I subscribed. So I'd been in the witchy space for a little while and was really enjoying that. Um, and that was probably around sort of like 2019 uh, that I started following those accounts, but it wasn't until um, about a year ago. That I started watching specific tarot tube um, and funnily enough I think the first well one of the first if not the first uh, tarot tuber um, if she's okay with me calling her that that I subscribed to was Anna at Astral Lady Tarot and I was like oh oh this is the bit of YouTube that I've been needing this level of nuance this, I've got in my notes, I've got it written as like high passion, low stakes. So it's most of my YouTube journey of the people that I've been subscribed to has been in the kind of beauty makeup sphere. Makeup is another special interest of mine. Of mine. I love it. Um, and it's all just very high production value. It's all filming in 4K and the clean, minimal backgrounds with a candle and all new, new, new and big kind of like consumerism and, and stuff and I've generally moved away from specifically creators like that um, but there's still, there's just this level of polish um, that feels like it's necessary or no, not necessary but um, required in the beauty space and then I came to tarot and there's like, there's a sense of it being just a little bit more casual, a little bit more, we all want to hear your opinion, everyone's opinion is valid, you don't have to buy things, you don't have to have new things, you can have been doing it for two weeks or two decades or 80 years and people still want to listen and I think it's one of the wonderful things about tag videos and what encouraged me to start a channel at all is that I know that I can watch 20 versions of the same tag, same questions, all different people answering them and I'll just keep watching them, I'll watch as many of them as there are and so there's room for kind of infinite creators 
and I just really love that and I love the community aspect to it and I mean social media has been really important for me anyway in terms of being a disabled mostly in the home person it's my access to the wider world and Tarot Tube in particular has really felt like a uh, a community that I could reach out and touch in a way that was sustainable and not necessarily detrimental to my mental health. Um, so yeah, I mean, in answer to the question, when did you get into Tarot Tube? Um, I genuinely, it's only been about a year and a half, um, but it's had a profound impact um, on me. Unfortunately, unlike other hobbies and interests, not so much on my wallet. So that's a bonus. Now on to Anna's questions. Uh, so the next question is, what makes you want a spiritual practice? Um, and I think that's a really fascinating thing to ask and I can't wait to hear other people's answers. Um, I remember being younger and being so jealous of people who had faith. Um, I think particularly when I was at the most kind of deep depths of struggling with mental health things and feeling like it wasn't going to end and how was I going to manage this. I had this sense that there would be people in the world who would go through something similar but because they had faith it just wouldn't impact them as much. And because I was like, I'd lost all kind of purpose and meaning in my life because I hadn't been able to continue academically and thus being aware I'd had all my self-worth and then I wasn't able to work. And so in terms of like capitalist ideas around worth and productivity and stuff, I was fighting a really uphill <laughs> battle to think that there was any point in me at all. Um, and I, I just remember being so jealous and I remember talking to my mum so kind of with so much frustration and anguish of just like how do I do that? How do I make my brain have faith? How do I make my brain believe in something? Not just bigger than me because I, I've always, I don't know, been so fascinated in like people and the world at large and different ways of doing things so it wasn't so much that I was like so deeply navel gazing or something but it was just that how could i find some external purpose outside of capitalism and i was just yeah so full of anguish and angst and it was just really hard and so i wanted a spiritual practice because i wanted to find meaning and purpose and a sense of something bigger and something to kind of make sense of things that were difficult but also my kind of inner sense of people being connected and I've always had quite a strong sense of like what's right and wrong um, I call that, you know, autistic sense of justice or, you know, whatever but I just, I knew that there was something kind of missing from my life but that hole has never been and arguably could never really be filled by something organised or structured like a religion because moving on to, I mean, the rest of the, the questions, my spiritual practice is based entirely on questions and the fact that it can grow and change and ebb and flow with me as a person, as I grow and evolve. I don't think I could have managed to have a spiritual practice of any great weight or impact on me without it being something really malleable um, and something that could could shift and move with me and that could could manage being questioned and interrogated and picked up and put down and nothing that was kind of going to bring me like loads of guilt or shame or something. Hello, one and a half years at Catholic school. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the next question is what myth drives your spiritual practice? And it's kind of a hard, a hard one to answer. There isn't a kind of a cornerstone, it's it's often shifting and changing. Um, 
but then when I was thinking about it, I'm thinking about myths and about the importance that the Greek myths have had on my life because all of these things come back to stories. I was a big fairy tale kid, I was a big myths and legends kid, I've always loved history and learning the stories that people tell each other. Um, and you know, like loads of people, the, uh, the Greek myths were very impactful for me. And so thinking about a myth that, I mean, it, it says drives my spiritual practice, but I think this one just more kind of like sums up the main themes of my spiritual practice is the, the story of Persephone. And I know that there are lots of academic thoughts and kind of like political-esque thoughts around Persephone and um, I'm not going to get into that because I'm not a scholar on it but from my very rudimentary very lay person's um, version of the story it's about cycles and about the the concepts of the necessity of death and rebirth and breaking everything down in order to build again but that that process isn't necessarily a peaceful one that there can be drama, ha, huh, tower nice, that there can be drama and there can be trauma and that these things, like a, a cycle, there's something about that that seems unfettered and undisturbed um, when we think about cycles, but like there's friction in the cycles of life and there's difficulty and there's obstacles, but the wheel keeps turning. Um, and I think that's how I imagine the story of Persephone is that these things have to happen and they keep happening and that is the way of nature and the seasons change but the sun will come back and that's a really important concept to me as it has been to people for millennia um, but also the idea that like it's all right I mean, it's shit that you, we have to struggle, but like, it's okay to struggle with these things. You don't have to always be happy-go-lucky and posy vibes only and stuff. And like, sometimes it's really dramatic and sometimes it's really awful. Um, but like, the sun will come again. And so that's 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 what I came up with in terms of a, a driving force or a myth that is a driving force um, in my spiritual practice. Okay, we're nearly there. Question number nine, what is it you do with your spiritual practice? And it, it's interesting, like I'd spend a lot of time on witchy YouTube with spells and rituals and you know, reading and watching a lot of stuff around like astral projection and spirit flight and all of these things. And I, I love all of that and I'm so fascinated in all of it. But truly, I am a kind of chronically ill, very, very tired often depressed, burnt out little autistic bean and my spiritual practice is so deeply ingrained with who I am as a person that in terms of like activities there's not an awful lot for me to to talk about. It's really embedded in my politics and my worldview um, and just kind of primarily it's about being present in the world and showing up, doing what I can and learning and continuing to learn where I can and being open to criticism and open to new ideas and something that's helped me so much has been finding my place in nature so I suppose things that I do in my spiritual practice are within my means trying to give back to everything that nature has given me um, in terms of well-being and serenity and peace and purpose and motivation and all of these sorts of things and so giving back to nature and finding ways to show up for my community within my fairly limited means um, kind of forms the basis of my spiritual practice but also tarot. <laughs> tarot is uh, I think probably going to be like a lifelong touchstone for bringing me back to myself and how I interpret the world and how I learn about people and how I connect with people um, 
and yeah I mean I also I love a bit of astrology I've been learning herbalism as hopefully to be a more useful tangible way to give back to my community and like part of that is like learning how to do low energy gardening and I'm really fortunate because um, I live with someone who is a tiny garden consultant and they write loads of really great blogs and have loads of really great advice about how to garden when you have fuck all energy and um, resources and time if that's something that you, you don't have much of Fortunately, I have a fair amount of time, but not much energy and not much money. Um, but yeah, so I'm really lucky. And um, if anyone's interested in that, I can uh, link to their stuff if, if that's interesting to you. But yeah, so I've been, I'm always learning and learning primarily is, is the basis of my spiritual practice, I suppose, is, is what I'm driving at. Um, so final question, what keeps you on your path? And again, I am just sort of repeating myself here now. Um, oh, has that been out of frame the whole time? Sweet. Oh, well, it's a podcasty video. <laughs> anyway, please forgive me. Um, right, final question. <laughs> Let's just get this done. Right, what keeps you on your path? The spiritual path I'm on is so indelibly linked with who I am as a person that I am always on my spiritual path uh, even if I don't pick up a tarot deck for six months or I forget where the moon is or um, my plants die or whatever happens it my spiritual path practice is constantly moving and shifting with me and that's kind of the only way that it would have been remotely sustainable for me to have anything like this um, because of energy levels and capacity and all of these sorts of things um, and you know the other side of that is if I really hyper focus on something for you know days weeks months years at a time then that's what my path is that's what's happening that's what I'm doing so that is what is spiritually fulfilling me um, it's, it's what I can do within capitalism, outside of capitalism, is my, my spiritual path. Um, and then in my notes I wrote something which is comically um, poetic, which is the cycles of the moon and sun are my path, and I can't deviate from them any more than the tide can. So I will leave you on that um, very poetic uh, note. I'm not a poet, um, but yeah, on that note, um, I absolutely suggest that you watch Anna's video and um, watch the other Tarot Origin Stories videos, um, they're all really fabulous and I think these are amazing questions, I cannot wait to watch more VRs. Um, because oh, this is this is the good stuff. This is the stuff that makes life worth living and conversations worth having, and it's just delicious. I love it. I love it. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for bearing with me and my very bad framing um, of this kind of podcasty episode. Episode video. Um, I really appreciate you sticking with me. Um, I hope you're looking after yourself, uh, take care and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Bye!